All right, welcome back, those that uh, are returning. And uh, welcome for those that are for the first time. We are going to look at this section here of the book of Revelation. But we want to pray first and then dive in. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the outpouring of your grace on our life today. And we thank you for this one hour and a half where we can uh, sit down and uh, look into your word and uh, gain new insights with regard to what is happening and what is going to happen in our world. May your spirit guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. As you remember, on the first night when we started together the book of Revelation, when we were looking at this section from the book of Revelation, we established that the seven churches were an outline of history from the time of Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension in seven stages or seven periods of time to the end. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And we also saw that this second section here of the seven seals or seven stages and the seven trumpets as well are the same seven stages of history from different perspectives. Now, last time we looked at the centerpiece, which is this one, Revelation 12 to 14. Tonight we are looking at this. the fifth section. But before diving into the text, I would like to remember or remind you of what we saw when we went through the seven trumpets. The seven trumpets, we said, are divine manifestations of justice, of preliminary justice, which means that justice throughout the history of Christianity is mixed with what? Mercy. So it's justice mixed with mercy throughout the history of Christianity up to the final section, which is the seventh section. Because in the seventh section, we have the seven plagues. So, in the seventh section here, we actually have the seven plagues. I drew it under here, so it's more visible. So, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven plagues. So these, are, these are the plagues. These are the trumpets. So, we have something here that is very similar to what happened at the conquering of Jericho. What is special about the story of Jericho? They conquered the city, how? Circling the city, how many days? Seven days. How many times a day? Hmm? Once. Every day, once. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven times. Five, six, seven. Can you see the parallel? So we have the trumpets. One, two, three, four, five, six. And when we reach the seventh, 
in the seven trumpet, we have seven subsection, like we have seven circles around the city of Jericho. I'm using this just to illustrate how you can keep in mind the connection between the two sections, the section of uh, the trumpets and the section of the plagues. Now, please follow me here. As you know, the first section parallels the seventh, right? The second section parallels the sixth. The third section parallels the fifth, meaning that the seven trumpets and the seven plagues are connected somehow. The question is, how are they connected? What are those elements that connect the third and the fifth? And of course, we have right on top here the centerpiece. But now we are interested in this area, three and five. And uh, if you want to look at this graph here, throughout the history of Christianity, we have the seven trumpets, the seven stages. But then... In the end time events, we have the seven bowls or the seven plagues that are poured out. The plague, the word itself, means what? That is something terrible. It's a catastrophe. It's some sort of uh, divine manifestation of judgment. So if you look at the seven trumpets as being the preliminary justice of God, meaning God doing justice throughout the history of Christianity. And then, at the end of the history of Christianity, God doing the final justice, the difference between the two, the difference between this section here and this one here, is that here we have Justice plus mercy. Here we have what? Only justice. How do I know? Well, we are getting now to the text. And to make the connection between section 3 and section 5, I'm starting with some verses in section 3, which is the final part of the seven trumpets. This is what it says. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and started, as the right translation there, to reign. Started to reign. So practically, when we reach the seventh trumpet, which is here, we don't have too much, too long until the end. But here, something happens which is expressed with the sentence, you started to reign. And then it goes on saying, the nations were angry and your wrath or anger came. Angry and wrath are the same word practically in the Greek there. So the nations were angry and your wrath or your anger has come. So please notice that God's wrath or anger is a response to somebody else's wrath or anger. To whose anger? The nation's anger. And the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and you should destroy those who destroy the earth. Without entering details, again, destruction from God is a result or response to destruction done by whom? 
by those who destroy the earth. So what I'm trying to point out is divine manifestation of justice does not happen in a vacuum. Justice, the mere concept of justice, responds to a call for justice. We had this tragedy in Texas the other day. And these days were extremely difficult for those that were directly somehow hit by this tragedy, but for the whole nation. And uh, here and there, you will hear a cry or a call for justice. Why? Why are they calling for justice? Because injustice has been done. Right? So when injustice is done, even human beings want justice. Now, if we human beings are in any way a reflection of God's way of reacting to reality, and we in our human heart and mind ask for justice, how much more God needs to do justice? But his justice is a response to the cry of his, of his people. Because remember, in the fifth seal, there were some souls under the altar crying out, saying, How long, O Lord, until you are going to avenge or do justice? Because what happens is throughout the seven trumpets, as God's people are persecuted or mistreated by the enemies of uh, God's people, they pray, they ask for justice. But God tells them, you have to wait a little longer. That was the answer given in the seals. You have to wait a little longer. But then we reach the point where Jesus starts reigning. But his reign starts in a very peculiar way. How? Revelation 15, verse 1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is, see this word here, complete. Exactly what I was saying before, that if throughout the history of Christianity, God intervenes with justice, but justice is mixed with mercy, here in the final segment, here, it's complete. Justice is complete. It's not mixed with mercy. Why is it mixed with mercy up to this point? Why is mercy mixed with justice? Because up to this point, those who persecute God's people have a chance to repent and change. At one point, we reach a moment of history after which there is no more repentance. There is no more possibility for repentance. And you may think, why? Well, the text will tell us. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over the image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. You know this picture, because uh, sometimes we use it in our church language, to see you at the sea of glass. Okay, it's from here. Okay, But what is interesting here is that after John sees the seven angels that will pour out the bowls or the plagues, there is an interlude here with these that are victorious over the beast. It's like in a movie. You know, in a movie, there are two different ways of uh, portraying reality. There is what is called flashback. You know what flashback is? When you're moving with the story, and then you're thrown back 
to the past. Or there is what is called fast forward. Meaning you are moving with the movie and then it stops here and you are thrown in the future. So before we are presented with the seven plagues being poured out on the earth, there is this interlude, a fast forward, as if telling us, hey guys, this section that is following now is a difficult section. But please know that those that are victorious over the beast, they are standing on the sea of glass, which is in front of the throne of God. Meaning they are safe. Don't worry about them. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. What is the song of Moses? What is the song of the Lamb? Both the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb is a song of liberation. In case of Moses, you have liberation from Egypt. In the case of the Lamb, we are freed from the Egypt of sin. Please notice these two elements here, because this is a beautiful Hebraic parallelism. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. These two sentences are synonymous, practically. In other words, for the overcomers of the beast, for those that are victorious over the beast, God's just and true works are great and marvelous. God's justice and truth are great and marvelous. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? Have you seen those two words together somewhere else? Fear and glorify? Of course. Several places, but in a very pointed way in the first angel's message, right? Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you. For, you, for your judgments have been manifested. Okay, so after we have this fast forward, now... It starts, after these things I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And what happens there? And out of the temple came the seven angels having, what? Seven plagues. Clothed in pure bright linen and having their chests girded with golden bands. Seven then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And now, please notice carefully what it says. And no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. What does that mean? Well, remember that at the beginning of each of the seven sections, we have an introductory vision. And the introductory vision always has to do with the sanctuary. And here, again, it starts with the sanctuary, but the sanctuary is filled with smoke, and we are told that from that point on, from that point on, until when? Till the seven plagues of the seven angels are completed, no one is able to enter the temple. Meaning, during this section, which is the final section, which this one is the same as this one, or this one. Okay? Nobody is able to enter the temple, which means, in the language of the Bible, that what Jesus has been doing up to this point ceases. Mercy, which is a result of him doing the intercession, is no more available. 
Therefore, throughout this time, the justice of God is manifested merciless. Meaning that people cannot turn, cannot repent, even if say they want it. Well, but the things leading up to this point are of such nature that everybody by this time has to make their decision. Because by this time when the temple is filled with smoke and uh, nobody can enter, there is no intercession, the sealing has taken place already on earth, sealing of God's people, and the marking of the beast as well. So by the time we are here and everything is decided, meaning there is no way to change your party, so to speak. If you are on the side of the lamb, you will not move to the side of the beast. And if you are on the side of the beast, you are not going to move to the side of the lamb. By this time, the sealing and the marking are done. Meaning, what we found in chapter 7 and then what we found in chapter 13 have taken already place. And from this point on, those that belong to the Lamb are with the Lamb for good, and those that belong to the beast are with the beast for good. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. This is chapter 16. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a full and lossome sore came upon the man who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Again, the text clearly says who are the target of the plague. Who are those? It's not God's people. It's those that have the mark of the beast, right? Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Then I heard, says John, the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord. The one who is and who was and who is to be because you have judged these things. Again, righteousness, divine righteousness and divine judgment are emphasized. For they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets. Oh, that's the problem. For they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets and you have given them blood to drink. So it's blood to blood for it is there just Due, a better translation would be they deserve it or they are worthy. So for us to not be confused, I will use as an illustration the tragedy of the school shooting. This whole scenario looks like law enforcement entering a classroom after the crazy guy has already shooted some of the kids. Blood has been shed already. Correct? So then what would you expect? For law enforcement to come in and uh, have a chit-chat with him? See, so it's that kind of a scenario. Things are so bad the abuse, the persecution, the bloodshed has been so bad that at one point the heavenly beings say you have given them blood to drink because the water became blood for it is their just due. They deserve it. They are worthy of it. It's not an arbitrary kind of intervention from God. It's not that God got mad because, um, I don't know, somebody upset him. No, no. These are some very real things here. And I heard another from the altar 
See the altar? Why is the altar in view here? Because I mentioned it before, there was a scenario in which the souls from under the altar were crying out for justice, right? In the fifth seal, in Revelation chapter 6. And I heard another from the altar saying, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues and they did not repent and give him glory. Well, something similar is being told in one of the trumpets that they did not repent. But there's a difference between the situation of the trumpets and this situation. What is the difference? In the situation of the trumpets, if they had wanted, they could have repented because mercy was still available. In this situation, since the temple service is already ceased, even if they, say, had wanted, they could have not repented because the marking, the sealing on one hand and the marking on the other hand is completed, is done. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom became full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. This is a very interesting picture because it looks like the whole throne of the beast and the kingdom of the beast become dark and it's a kind of confusion where people don't know what they are doing. They don't understand what is happening. Four of the plagues had already been poured out and this is now the fifth and after everything that had happened now darkness where you cannot see what is going on. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. Again, it's emphasized. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. This is a very interesting historical picture because this is what Babylon, the old city, a historic city, looked like. Babylon was crossed by the river Euphrates. What happened is that at one point, Cyrus, the king of uh, the Persians, wanted to conquer the city. And this is history. We have relevant sources in history books. And in order to get into the city, he came up with a trick. This river was stopped here, was blocked, was dammed, and diverted in a different direction. And during the night, as a surprise, they walked into the city through the bed of the river. Now, the sixth plague says that the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. Well, this king Cyrus in the Bible is called my anointed or my shepherd. That's how God calls Cyrus. Why? Because Cyrus prefigures Jesus Christ coming. Because just the way in the time of Cyrus, he conquered Babylon. And as a result of him conquering Babylon, Israel was able to go back to their country. At the end, in the sixth 
plague right here in this segment, before the final segment, something happens with the water of uh, the river Euphrates. But we are told later, and I will show you, that the waters actually is a symbol for people, nations. So something happens, and as a result of that, the kings from the east, led by Jesus Christ, are able to march into Babylon, and from Babylon... God's people are set free. They can exit Babylon. Babylon being a symbol. And you will see later what Babylon means. Yes, Babylon is portrayed as a city. But Babylon, the city, is actually a woman. A woman riding the beast, a harlot. That's what she is called in chapter 17. Oh, we are getting there too. But here again as a parenthesis, we are thrown back a little bit. So historically we are here in this segment. But we are thrown back a little bit somewhere here. It's a retrospective presentation and the language shows it in the Greek and I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Three unclean spirits, like frogs. Have we seen three somewhere else? Of course we have. Because we know that here, where the sixth trumpet or seal or church starts, there is the three angels' message. And that three angels' message is masqueraded by the three frogs' message. See what is happening? You have a three angels' message, and you have the three frogs' message face to face, meaning that while God's gospel is being preached in the final segment of uh, the earth's history, right before the time of grace is concluded. So on this section here, because here you have the three angels' message. Before, remember, throughout this time here, throughout the 42 months or 1,260 days or years, you had two witnesses. The witnesses went up, and then instead of two witnesses, you have three witnesses, meaning that the whole message becomes urgent, becomes very important, becomes critical. Why? Because you are close to the time when grace is up. Mercy will be no more available. So you can clearly see that while God's message of the gospel or of the Lamb is being preached, there is a three frogs message also preached in this world. And we are in that time where there is the preaching of the gospel on one hand and there is the preaching of the three frogs message on the other hand, which is practically three unclean spirits, for they are spirits of demons. Oh, performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. That is what is happening now. On one hand, the gathering of God's people, God's Israel, as it's described in chapter 7 of the book of Revelation, and this other gathering to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And there's a warning here. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walks naked and they see his shame. And that's for us, that warning there. And then it continues, 
and they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon or Mount of Megiddo, Har Megiddo, Magedon. Mount of Megiddo. Now, what is the Mount of Megiddo? Because obviously here we have to do with another symbol. Well, this is what happens. In history, you had Babylon, I'm drawing Babylon here, and you had Israel here. Now, when Babylon came to conquer this territory here, Canaan, they would never come this way. Do you know why? Because of the desert. You can't march with the army through the desert. They would always come like this. And come down. Okay? So what happens is that somewhere here, there is a plain called Megiddo. And whenever they were attacked from the north, this is where the army of Israel would face them. But the name of the plain is Megiddo, but it's not a mountain. And here we are told that it's Har Megiddo, or mountain of Megiddo. Well, there's an explanation for that. Because close to this plain of Megiddo, there is also the mountain of Carmel. And that's where Elijah faces in that final battle between who serves God and who serves Baal. The big final decision. The critical decision. And that's the final battle of Armageddon. So practically what we are being told is that uh, here there is that final battle between Israel and the enemy of Israel or between those that belong to Jerusalem and those that belong to Babylon. What is interesting is that we don't have a description of the battle itself. In chapter 7, we have the 144,000 lined up as an army. They enter what is called there the Great Tribulation. And then we see them coming out of the Great Tribulation. We don't have a precise description of what exactly happens in that final battle. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. So what we have here is the finish of the battle. But we have a little insight as to what happens to Babylon. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and there, were a great, there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city, which is Babylon, was divided into three parts, which means it falls apart, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her what? The cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. That's a pretty complicated concept. The cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. But why is she, Babylon, getting that? We'll see in chapter 17. So the seventh play concludes with this. And great hail from heaven fell upon man each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail 
since that plague was exceedingly great. But as I said, something happens to Babylon. Through the river Euphrates, Cyrus entered the city, and similarly, Jesus, when he comes, something happens which is the equivalent of the waters of the Euphrates River being dried up, and Jesus enters into Babylon, and uh, his people is freed. But what happened to Babylon? Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. So now after we've seen all the history of the seven plagues, and we know here Babylon is destroyed, one of the angels takes John and says, Okay, now let me just tell you the story or show you the story of the great city Babylon. Just focus on that a little bit. Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And the wine of fornication in the Bible is some sort of a false teaching, a teaching that contradicts the teaching of God. So this woman, the harlot, Babylon, intoxicated or made drunk the inhabitants of the earth with the wine of her false teachings, fornication. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So here we have the definition of waters. That's verse 15. Why do I need that definition? Because I'm told that the harlot sits on waters. And then I was told before that the waters of the river Euphrates at one point are dried up. So when the waters of the river Euphrates dry up, it's not water that you drink. It is peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. But let's just follow the story. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. Oh, in the wilderness. Do you remember where we left the woman? Where we saw her the last time? In the wilderness. What was she doing in the wilderness? She went there to be protected by God. To escape. Right? The dragon was throwing flood after her. The earth opened its mouth and the flood was swallowed. So we thought from history the woman learned her lesson that she can cling and rely on the lamb, right? And I saw the woman sitting on a scarlet beast which was full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns. Now, Throughout this period here, the beast was persecuting God's people. There was a time where the beast was not persecuting because one of the heads of the beast was wounded. A wound that seemed to be mortal. But then the beast comes back. And the same kind of situation that was happening here is repeated over here. So now... This beast that he sees in chapter 17 is the same beast that we saw in chapter 13, but with a difference. It's a scarlet beast. Why? Because it's a persecuting beast again. Here, persecution is happening. After the model of the 42 months or 1260 years or days. Okay, so the scarlet beast, which is full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of 
abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. That's an ugly picture, right? And on her forehead, a name was written, Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So what happens is, somehow during this time, when the beast is not a persecuting power because one of his heads is wounded, he courts the woman and convinces the woman to become his lover. And when the beast comes back here, on this segment, it's not only the beast, it's the woman riding a beast. And the woman is drunk with the blood of the saints, and the beast is a scarlet beast. And that's a terrifying picture. Because in the end, what we get to know is that only a remnant of the seed of the woman stay faithful to the Lamb. The woman, by and large, let me explain that, Christianity, by and large, becomes unfaithful to the Lamb and becomes the harlot or the lover of the beast and becomes a persecuting power when I saw her, says John, I marveled with great amazement. Do you know why he's marveling with great amazement? Because he had seen that woman before. The shiny woman. And when he sees her now, he can't believe. What has happened? What is going on here? It's like when I saw um, a childhood friend from the church, somebody I grew up with, I saw her in a context from far, and I couldn't recognize her. She looked in a certain way, and I was looking, is that her? I can't believe that's her. And lo and behold, it was her. But a change happened. And the woman now is riding the beast her persecuting efforts and the beast's persecuting efforts are now put together. And it goes on, but the angel said to me, why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the seven horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend. That's a very tricky uh, Greek way of saying that the beast was that segment, then is not this segment here where the beast is wounded, and then will come or will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. Why from the bottomless pit? Because it was the beast from the bottomless pit that appeared in chapter 11 that took him out through that mortal, seemingly mortal wound. So now when it comes back, it comes from there, from the devil himself, so to speak. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was, again, was, is not, and yet is. That's not a good translation there. It should be and will come. But it's the same structure. Was, is not, will be. Okay? And the same idea of the book of life, or the names written in the book of life, you can see that in chapter 13. Same exact sentence. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. 
Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. And the beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition. Now, I know this is one of the riddles of the book of Revelation. If I am to stop here, we can spend the night and uh, tomorrow just looking at that riddle. I will give you some uh, pointers in the Q&A section, but I don't want to stop now because we want to follow the story. So the point is, there's an explanation with regard to the heads of the beast, and then the horns which you, are, which you saw are the ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. So that's still of the future. I haven't seen any good and reasonable explanation as to who exactly these ten horns kings are. These are of one mind and they will give their power and authority to the beast. This is what it looks like. So there are seven heads throughout history. And then in the final section there are ten horns which are also kings, whatever that means. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for He is Lord of Lord and King of King. And those who are with Him are called, chosen, and faithful. This is the focus of the, of the chapter, that those that are with the Lamb will overcome this power, no matter what. For He is Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast... These will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. So the kings that submit their authority to the harlot, in the end, turn against her and uh, make her desolate and naked and burn her with fire and eat her flesh. That's strange. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. What words? I believe the words of God that have to be fulfilled is this one that we saw in the seventh plague. It is done. That was the words of God in the seventh plague. So, what we have is this, a harlot sitting on a beast, and the harlot and the beast together are sitting on the waters, on the people, on the inhabitants of the earth. So it's a woman on the beast, a religious power, riding a political power, and the two together persecuting the saints. How? Riding the inhabitants of the world. And we know from chapter 13 how he convinces the inhabitants of the world. Through deception. And chapter 18 doesn't do anything but tell us about the destruction of Babylon. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon, the great is fallen, is fallen. And has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, the kings of the earth, are mentioned the merchants, so there's a, an economic component to it as well, just like in chapter 13, where you can't sell or buy unless you take the mark of the beast. So the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And then there's this cry 
another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, that is from Babylon, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. And that happens here when uh, the river Euphrates, the waters of the river Euphrates are dried up and uh, Jesus Christ can march in. And that's when people come out of Babylon. For her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. And then we have the kings that weep and lament for her. We have also the merchants weep and mourn. And there's a list of the merchandise, what kind of merchandise they were trading with Babylon. And among them, the final component of uh, this package of merchandise is and bodies and souls of men. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great milestone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. And that practically concludes the story of Babylon. What we got from all this is that this final segment of divine justice is a very difficult segment of the history of Christianity. Because the same kind of reality that happened here in the past will be reiterated at a probably much higher level because now we don't have to deal with a beast only, like in the press, but also with a woman, which is uh, a symbol for apostate or rebellious or unfaithful uh, Christianity riding the beast. Which means that the final persecution will be a religious political kind of persecution. This uh, section of the book of Revelation is difficult to take. The most hopeful or hope-filled part of this entire chapter is this. These will make war with the Lamb and the Lamb will overcome them for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. So the question is, what does it mean, this section here? Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. So the heads... Let me paint a beast with seven. This is a beast, okay? It has a tail. <laughs> seven heads. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay? It says that the seven heads are seven mountains. Mountains in the Bible means kingdom, kingdoms, among other things. But then it specifies there are also seven kings. A better translation would be these, that is the heads, are also seven kings. And it says five have fallen, so one, two, three, four, five have fallen. One is, so this is, and the other has not yet come. So this one has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. And the beast that was and is not, 
is himself also the eighth. Oh. But is of the seven and is going to perdition. So this eight is practically one of these seven. So there are all kinds of explanations. One is that if you take John, because the conversation is between John and that specific angel, then you have to take John's time in consideration when he lived. When did John live, the writer of the book? Or what was the kingdom under which John the Apostle lived? Rome. Okay? So then, this is Rome. So then going backwards, Greece, Middle Persia, Babylon, but then, oh, what else? So some will say it's Assyria and it's Egypt. Yeah, technically, Egypt indeed was a persecuting power, Assyria as well. But I never find Egypt or Assyria in a chain of a time prophecy, so I have a little trouble with this. Another way of putting it is to see John as uh, being part of the history of the segment to which this whole thing refers. Because the beast that you saw was, so here is the segment that was, then is not, this is the section that is not, like here, this one, and then, the section that will be, okay? So in that context, if we take the time of is not, so right now the beast is not, so John is here. In his vision is here. So then the question is, in this section where this beast is not, what beast? is there? Well, I would say the beast that took out the beast of the sea. The beast that caused the wound, the mortal or seemingly mortal wound, which was what, what beast? It was the beast from chapter 11 that came from the bottomless pit and uh, then this is, uh, instead of Rome here, you have the beast from the bottomless pit. And you, back, you go backwards. This is uh, the sea beast. This is Rome. This is Greece. This is Middle Persia. And this is Babylon. So here is the beast that comes from the bottomless pit in chapter 11. This is possibly the second beast or the, the earth beast from uh, chapter 13. And this eight here, which says that is one of the seven, is none else than this beast here being reiterated. I know this must have been complicated, but uh, for, for those that uh, will re-watch and re-study, you can go through it and see the logic. I believe this final one has the most cogent internal textual proof. But again, it is difficult to identify all of those. Yes, very, very uh, insightful question. So in chapter 17, we have uh, descriptions 
in which the kings, the kings of the earth, hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So it seems that in the final stage of the existence of Babylon, those ten kings, whoever they are, that have given all their support to Babylon, for some reason turn against Babylon. And I see that happening in the context of the drying up of the water of the river Euphrates, which means that the people that supported the system also start turning against the system. They withdraw their support. And um, what is interesting that in the destruction of Babylon in chapter 18, we see the kings lament Babylon. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. It's like weeping and, and uh, lamenting and crying, saying it's incredible how everything fell apart just like that. Let me give you an illustration. And this is a real story. It was on YouTube. A guy treated his wife poorly. And um, after a while, she decided to leave. And she left. But he would beat her. So she decided not to come back to him. So now he posted on YouTube an appeal for her to come back, in which he laments and says, Oh, my darling, who's going to give me now money to do this or that? Who's going to help me uh, with my clothes, with my food? Okay, so, so practically the lament is about this kind of thing. After they turned against Babylon for some reason, and the reason, I think, is given by the text, 17. It says that God has put into their hearts to fulfill His purpose, to be on one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. So something very mysterious happens with them because it seems that God Himself makes them do or puts in their hearts to do what they do, to give their kingdom to the beast. So in any case, something happens and they go against the woman, they destroy the woman, they bring the woman down, but then they wake up, okay, but if we did this, all is gone. All the luxury, all the benefits coming from the woman, are gone. And that's when they start lamenting. It's the loss they suffer because of the destruction of the system from which they could milk their benefits. So the beast, in biblical language, is a political power. A political power that becomes a persecutor of God's people. That's the beast. The apostate woman in the Bible is God's people that becomes unfaithful. In Old Testament language, the same Israel that is praised at one point as being the faithful woman, is later criticized as being the unfaithful or harlot. Okay? So uh, those 
textual backgrounds from the book of Daniel and from the other books of uh, the prophets show me that the beast has to be a political power, the woman has to be a religious power, and the political power is uh, somehow perpetuated throughout history through the heads and that's what I was trying to describe here with this uh, wonderful masterpiece of art. <laughs> and then in the final segment, the political power will rest on these 10 horns, which are kings. And the full picture is you have the woman on top, sitting on the beast, sitting on the water. So practically you have a persecuting, because she's drunk with the blood of the saints, a persecuting religious power sitting on a persecuting political power, the two together sitting on the waters, which is the inhabitants of the earth. And it's no wonder that this is a, an all-pervasive and uh, uh, all-encompassing system because in chapter 13 we saw last time how the second beast, the beast from the earth, convinced the inhabitants of the world to create an icon or to create a replica, an image of the beast, meaning that the same kind of reality that was experienced in history under this section here will be reiterated under this section here. The river Euphrates is a border in some passages. Meaning that, for instance, when God's people rebelled against God, God would sometimes tell them, hey, I will allow the river Euphrates to flood and uh, come over you. Obviously, it was not about uh, the waters of the river Euphrates. It was a symbol used for invasion meaning that uh, if God had Euphrates flood, it means that his people will be invaded by the people of Euphrates. So that's one of the components. And uh, that element is uh, pointed out in chapter, I believe, 9, the river Euphrates, is mentioned with that insight. Another aspect of the river Euphrates is that uh, when Babylon was conquered, when it was uh, invaded by Cyrus, the river Euphrates was used to practically trick the watch of the city and get into the city because they diverted the river. Now, these two components, I believe, are together here. Because first, it appears that uh, the river Euphrates is flooding, which means attack or persecution. But then the river Euphrates is dried up, which reminds of what happened in history when Cyrus was able to march into the city. So those two images, I believe, overlap. So among other things, here in Revelation 11, uh, verses 18 and uh, then 19, God says, and uh, should destroy those who destroy the earth. Here, the 24 elders are speaking. I think the 24 elders speaking is important because the 24 elders in the way I see their role are involved in the divine government including divine justice and I see the same thing 
both in Job's story and in the book of Daniel. So the justice process somehow involves the 24 elders. So they are saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty. The nations were angry. Your wrath has come. And that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. So here we have two components of justice. Justice involves reward and also destruction. I know there is reluctance from some people to see the destruction of earth here as some sort of ecological reality. I don't think we should necessarily explain that away. I believe this involves that as well, includes that as well. Nevertheless, contextually, the focus is the reward of uh, the servants, prophets and saints, as opposed to those that destroy the earth being destroyed. So the focus is not on nature necessarily. It is on those that destroy the earth. What I see here is not the result of the problem, which is ecological issues, but rather the cause, the roots that lead to those ecological problems. Because throughout the book of uh, Revelation, and not only throughout the Bible, it is immorality or disconnectedness from God that brings about all kind of other problems. So that's why I wouldn't put the main focus on ecology, but I wouldn't explain away that component either. I believe from a divine perspective, what we have done with our earth by and large, including humans, but not excluding the animal world and vegetation, and even the raw material of the earth, I believe even that asks for divine justice. And the text supports that. Good question. So is the moment of the river Euphrates the final destruction of um, the supporters of this beast and uh, woman Babylon? Or is the moment when they turn against the system? I believe is the moment when they turn against the system. Why? Because it is only the next segment, the seventh plague, which uh, seems to be the finish line. This Euphrates River story is in the sixth, not in the seventh plague. So you have one more plague. If it was the destruction in view in uh, the sixth plague, then the seventh plague is unnecessary. Good question. Let me repeat this question because I've heard that, uh, that explanation as well. So some people suggest that the Battle of Armageddon is something that happens after the thousand years, after the resurrection of the wicked. I believe the text doesn't support that. This section here, starting with uh, the middle section, the centerpiece. This section here is chronological all the way to the end. Here, you have repetitions going back again and again to the beginning and coming all the way to the end. This one here is chronological. When the seven plagues are done, the next moment that we'll see in section 6 is when Jesus appears on the white horse, victorious. 
so then the saints are taken home, the wicked are destroyed. And then here, in the seventh section, we have uh, the recreation of the new earth, and uh, that's the context in which um, the wicked are also resurrected right before that happens. So there's a gap in between the, the Armageddon battle and that final clash, which actually never happens. Because based on Revelation 20 and 21, we'll see in uh, two weeks, the final attempt of attack of the resurrected wicked against the city of New Jerusalem remains an attempt. It never happens, really, because when they gather up to attack, fire comes and devours them. To, to the question whether it's a physical or spiritual battle, I would simply answer it's a battle. And the reason I'm, I'm saying it like that is because to me, whether it's physical or spiritual, does not diminish its severeness, its cruelty, its difficulty. Because this is how we used to think. If it's not physical, oh, okay. As long as they will not hit me, I'm fine. But that's not, that's not a, a good way of looking at it. Because of the highly symbolic language, it's very hard to say if it's physical or not. But I would not limit it to a spiritual reality. Because the seven plagues, whether I take them literally the way they are described or as symbols, those are very real things. So something tangible, I think, is in view. In chapter 13, there's a mentioning about a death decree that will be given against those that will not accept to take the um, mark of the beast, okay? They will give a decree to be killed, for those to be killed. Some say that decree happens after the time of grace is over. Some say it happens before. But in any case, a dead decree is a dead decree. I don't think a dead decree is about killing us spiritually. Lord, thank you so much for uh, your guidance. Yes, it's a difficult part of the book of Revelation. And uh, we are trying to understand as much as possible. And this was just a starter. I pray that you will continue to give us the desire to dig deeper and to understand more and more your word. In Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit, amen.